All right, so we are going to be covering a topic this evening that usually creates the most problems and technical difficulties wherever I go. So if we run into technical problems, it's usually this evening. Um, and it's this topic. And uh, indeed, we were running into that because our internet was just too slow to be able to really broadcast, but thankfully we got that worked on. We'll see what else falls apart, um, but not the message, because the message is beautiful. And uh, we're going to be looking at this topic, leaving your baggage behind. Leaving your baggage behind. There is a, a strong observation in the research world, and that is that what individuals go through in their younger years has a tremendous impact on how they live in the later years. Now, we understand that when it comes to things like um, one's tendency to develop alcoholism later with an alcoholic home, or to be an abuser later to be by being in an abuser's home, or other things of that nature. But what we haven't understood is that that has a very strong relationship to health as well. Uh, in fact, there's a whole set of studies called the ACEs studies, the Adverse Childhood Events Studies. Now, these come through Kaiser Permanente, and <clears throat> really it came from uh, a weight loss program. <laughs> Kaiser was putting on a program to help individuals lose weight, a physician-led program with a whole team to help their patients to lose weight because with obesity, there are a whole bunch of health consequences with it, you know, high blood pressure and high cholesterol and coronary artery disease and cancers and other types of things that come along with that overweight and obesity. And so they were trying to help get at those roots of those things and helping people out. And they had tremendous success. People were losing 50, 100 pounds in a year and, uh, you know, getting off of medications, reversing blood pressure and other things of that nature. But now as the people are off the program, Program, and the, the lead uh, physician in this, uh, this intervention was then starting to follow up with patients who had gone through the program before. He found out many of them were actually starting to gain the weight back. Not, not unfamiliar, you can lose weight and then you start gaining it back. And so he started to investigate why is this happening, what's going on? And so he was talking with one of his patients <clears throat> Uh, uh, a woman who had been through the program and she had lost somewhere between that 50 to 100 pounds and uh, you know he's wanting to understand why she put the weight back on well he found out that the reason why that she did is because as she lost the weight she became a bit more um, she 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 had more attention as she lost the weight from the opposite gender. And that attention from the opposite gender was dangerous to her, why? Because of the things that she had gone through when she was younger. And so it was safer to be big and not have that attention than it was to lose the weight, be healthier, and have that attention. And so that got his cogwheels going, and he started wondering, well, that's interesting. I wonder who else, you know? So he called, and he started following up with some more of the patients, and indeed, men, women, others, finding out the issues that had happened when they were young were affecting their life and their health and so on later on in life. And so they put together a whole survey that they sent out. I mean, Kaiser has millions of patients, and the survey went out and they had well over 200,000 responses back from the surveys. And from the surveys, they could then go through their electronic medical record system and find, you know, what diseases that people are suffering with, how many of them are smoking, and how many of them are, you know, participating in these bad behaviors and so on. And what they found is that there was, there was a very strong correlation between what happened in their childhood, how many adverse childhood events that they had, and the, the health outcomes that they had. Diabetes and, and cancer and, and autoimmune conditions and so on and so forth that people suffered, and also bad behaviors like smoking and drinking alcohol and being involved in risky uh, sexual behaviors and other types of things of that nature. 
a very strong correlations, stronger correlations than the correlations of smoking with lung cancer. Stronger correlations than bad diet with obesity. Stronger correlations than almost anything that we can find in the research literature is how many adverse childhood events someone had when they were young and their health outcomes later in life. And I can't tell you how many patients that I have taken care of and I've interacted with, and I, <laughs> when do they develop their cancer? When do they develop their autoimmune disease or other things of that nature? After some kind of major event that happened in their life, some kind of li lo loss, some kind of trauma, some kind of, you know, mother died, uh, lost a career, uh, they're in a, a legal battle with somebody over something or, or something of that nature, some big issues that are going on, and now you see the manifestations of that in their disease states and what's going on in their body. And one thing that research is, does not have the answer for is how can you fix something when somebody's been through those, those situations, right? The, the idea is to try to educate the future generation so that they don't repeat all of the bad stuff to their children and so that that generation can grow up with better you know, results than the prior generation. But for those that have already been through it, there's no solution. But that's because science won't go here. And this is where you find the solutions. And um, if you want to know how to be free from the past and where to be free, this is it. There's nowhere else that you can be free. But most individuals don't know that, and most individuals don't know how and what that looks like. And so we're just going to go through this and, and seek to understand what God did in order to set us free from the past so that we don't have to be a slave to it and bound in that direction that the past uh, seems to guide us in. Now, uh, Paul comments on this in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He says, for he made him who knew no sin to, to what? Sin to be sin us. for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Right. So he made him, he, the father, made him the son who knew no sin. He didn't commit sin, didn't give in to sin, didn't participate in it, didn't succumb to it, you know, and so on. He who knew no sin to, to what? Be sin. Be sin, right? It's, it's one thing to be like something. It's another thing to be it. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to carry something. It's another thing to be the thing. It's one thing to be associated with something. It's another thing to be that thing. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Why? That we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, I can't comprehend how Jesus could be sin. <laughs> You know, the perfect Jesus. I mean, how could he be sin? And equally, I cannot comprehend how I can be the righteousness of God and him either. Because I know my life, my past, my history, my thoughts, my all, you know, all that kind of stuff. Just as impossible as I, in my mind for Jesus to be sin is in my mind for me to be righteousness. But that's what Paul is talking about. So let's take a look at it this experience of the cross. And the experience of the cross, we have essentially two experiences coming to the cross. You have the experience of Jesus. Jesus, well, he was, he was fully man, and he was fully God. So, you know, sometimes that gets a little confusing, and I can't understand that entirely. How can, <laughs> how can he be fully God and fully man? But he was. And, uh, and, he lived that life perfectly, no sin, no mistake, and well, I can't say, you know, when he was a baby and he was learning how to walk, guess what? Yeah, he fell down. But what did he do? He got back up. That's right. And then he fell down and he got back up and fell down and got back up, fell down and got back up, and so on and so forth. And when he was six and he was trying out the, you know, the planer or other things like that that his father used with, with carpentry, well, he didn't do it perfectly, you know, but he did it as well as he could for a six-year-old. 
And when he was eight, he did it better than when he did it at six. And by the time he was 16, there was probably no one that you could find that could do it much better than he could. Right. So <clears throat> he was perfect. He did not rebel. He did not uh, sin in his thoughts, in his words, in his actions. And who did he live his life for? For himself? Oh. No, for others. Right? For his father. He came to represent his father. He came to reach others. Right? Not for himself, but for others he lived and thought and prayed. Right? So if you live for others, if you think for others, if you pray for others, if your life is about others, <clears throat> then what others do, you don't take personally. Because it's not about you. Again, we looked at that a, a few, you know, a few evenings ago, that what somebody says and what somebody does is about them. It's, it, it's what's in them. And if they do it at you or to you, well, it's still about them. It's not about you. And also, we looked at the buffet. <laughs> God has a buffet of love, and there's a whole bunch of buffets of selfishness walking around as well. And you and I have the option, by God's grace, to take from the buffet of God's love, or we can do the normal, which is take from the buffets of selfishness. And what somebody else says and somebody else does, we don't have to take it in. But if we believe that it's true, we will take it in. So Jesus, did he know the truth? Yes. Yes. What did he take in? The truth. What did he not take in? The lies. That's right. So when lies came from others, did he take it in? No. Who did he take from? His father. That's right. He took from his father. Did his father lie to him? No. Did his father hurt him? No. Right? So he never took anything personally from what others said and did. Never. Not even once. And he, his love was a selfless love. It was always for the good of others. And he responded perfectly to everything that ever happened to him, even though what happened to him was oftentimes not very good. But his response to it was very good. Now, you and I, when we respond to things, we respond for us. Right? We respond for us. We respond for how we perceive it. We respond for how we feel. We respond for how it threatens us or what we must fix or other things of that nature. But that's because we come from a selfish background. Jesus came from a selfless background, so his responses were for who? Others. For others. That's right. It was for others. So, when, uh, when Jesus was clearing out the temple, and he got that cord of rope, and he started throwing things over, and so on, and, and people were scattering and running out of the temple. Was he doing that for himself? No. No. He was doing it for? His father. Yes, for his father. But he also manifested the way that he manifested, because that's what they needed. That's what they needed. Not because it was, you know, he was there and now he's like, oh, I can't believe you are doing this. You know, and whatever. That's kind of how we respond. Did he know that they were doing that? Well, yeah, he knew they were doing that. And did he know before he got there? Yeah. Oh, yeah, he knew before he got there. Was he getting all riled up the closer he was getting? And like, oh, 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 now I can blow up and you know? No. But it was for his father, and it was the response that they needed to have. Right? So every time Jesus responded, it was for them. It was always a perfect response. And Jesus had good ripples. Well, what do you mean by good ripples? <laughs> Not good wrinkles, good ripples. Well, the effect of the stone is not just the stone going in the water and bloop, but it's the ripples that go out from there. It's the effect, it's the influence, it's the, the uh, well, yeah, the influence of the life that goes on from there. And since he was the perfect, uh, it was a perfect life, 
then it was perfect effects that went out from there as well. And those effects went out throughout all time. Um, Adam and Eve, 4,000 years before, blessed by the life of Christ. Abraham, blessed by the life of Christ. Uh, everybody through the Old Testament, blessed by the life of Christ. You and I, a couple thousand years later, blessed by the life of Christ. How long are those ripples going to go? Forever. That's right, forever. <clears throat> he wasn't a pebble dropped in a little puddle. This was the rock of ages, right? In all of space and time. And yes, space as well. You know, we on earth are affected by the life of Christ, but are not the angels also affected by that life too? And if God has created other creatures on other planets, I can't imagine he hasn't. But, you know, if he has, does his life not affect them as well? Yes. Well, yeah, throughout all time and space. And they're perfect ripples. And one of the things about ripples is when ripples go, you can't get them back. <laughs> you try to catch the ripples, guess what you do? You make more ripples. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> And so these are good ripples. That's good. They're not coming back. <laughs> and they're going to do their work. And, and Jesus had power. What kind of power? Power to do the good and power to avoid the evil. Right? Power to do the good and power to avoid the evil. And with that kind of life, Jesus came to the cross with no baggage. No baggage. He didn't have any personal stuff that he was carrying around. No baggage. <clears throat> And that life is the only life that deserves or earns <clears throat> eternal life. The only one. Right. The law of God requires perfect conformity to that law. Any of us can handle that? Can we, can we give God perfect conformity to his law? No, we, we lost it. Long ago, humanity lost it. And we're born into that lost state. Right. But that doesn't mean that that criteria is still not there. <clears throat> and Jesus came and he lived it. He lived the law in part. You want to see what the law is like, how wonderful the law is? Just look at Jesus. Because he lived consistent with that law. And he showed what it was like. Now that's one experience that comes to the cross. The other experience that comes to the cross is what? <laughs> it's us. That's right. <clears throat> and we are fully uh, human, and we're not divine. And the human part, well, don't do it exactly so well. Um, so instead of being perfect, you and I are sinful. What does sinful mean? Selfish. Well, selfish, yeah. But let's take that. Sinful. <laughs> What is sinful? <laughs> full of sin. Yeah, breaking the law. Uh huh. Full of breaking the law. Sin, full, full of sin. Full means what? Complete. <laughs> yep, complete. No room for anything else. Right? So we are so full of sin, there's no room for anything else. Now there's a new term that I'm trying to coin, and that is. We, we wordize in our family, right, to make up words. And uh, anyway, so one of the words that I want to wordize is righteousful. Right? Righteousful. Right? So Jesus was righteousful. What does that mean? Full of righteousness, right? What does full mean? No room for anything else. So, so full of righteousness, there's no room for anything else. We're so full of sin, there's no room for anything else. Quite the opposite. It's interesting because you take the characteristics of Jesus, and then you want to compare ourselves to it. You have to go to this book called a thesaurus, and you look up the, sem the section called antonyms. Antonyms. So you go to the thesaurus, you take anything that describes Jesus well, and his character, and then you go there and you go to the antonym section, and then you go, oh, yep, that's me, yep, yep, oh, yeah, that's me, oh, yep, that's me, yep, that's, that's me. So, he was perfect, or righteous full, or sinful. He never took anything personally hurt. I mean, he never took anything personally, so he was never personally hurt. What about us? Every time, every time we take it personally, right? We do. 
Somebody says something and they half step on our toe, we're just like, oh, mm, mm. you know? Yes, we take things personally. He had a love that was selfless. What about us? Selfish. That's right. <laughs> That's right, completely the opposite. He responded perfectly to everything that ever happened. What about us? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not so much, not so much. So when you don't respond perfectly, when you respond imperfectly, do others take that personally? Well, yeah, they take that personally. When you're not being perfect and you're around other people, then they take that personally. And they get hurt. So you are a perpetrator. Because that's what a perpetrator is, right? So you're a perpetrator. But not only that, uh, we're not just perpetrators, we are victims. Uh, so we take things personally from what others uh, say and do, and we carry that from the point of origin, and we keep carrying it, and we keep carrying it forward, and we keep carrying it, and we keep carrying it, and we keep carrying it, and keep carrying it. So the event that happened 35 years ago, we still carry because we're the victim. Right? And he had good ripples. What about us? Bad ripples. Bad ripples. That's right. <clears throat> Bad ripples. And the thing about ripples are that when they go, can't get them back. That's right. They're gone. Once you say that word, there is no getting that, catching it, and stuffing it back in your mouth and putting reverse on that whole thing. Ah, the word went, and the word will have its effect. <clears throat> and that thing that you did, and that way that you responded, and so on, you cannot undo it. You did it. And so we've got bad ripples. If you ever want to know if you have bad ripples, measure your wife. Well, yes, you can ask your wife. That's right. Uh -huh. Yeah, you can ask your wife. But even if she won't tell you the truth, all you have to do is have children. And you will find out whether you've got bad ripples or not. Because you will see you come out in the next generation. And if you're as dull as I am, for the first number of years as you're dealing with these brats, and you're, try you're wondering why are they so horrible, and why do they respond this way? And why are they so disrespectful? And so on and so forth. Then eventually one day you wake up and you go, oh. 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 That's me. That's why they do it. It's me. Oh. Poor kids. Poor kids. <clears throat> so yeah, and if you don't fig you don't figure it out on that generation, just wait until you have grandchildren, and then yeah. <laughs> you get another opportunity to find out that your your ripples just keep going. And he had power to do the good and avoid the evil. We are powerless to do the good and powerless to avoid the evil, but we have much power to do the evil and much power to avoid the good. And he had no baggage. What about us? Baggage. Lots of baggage. Lots of baggage. So, the experience of Jesus coming to the cross, the experience of us coming to the cross. We are the polar opposite of Jesus coming to the cross. And our life deserves eternal death. It deserves eternal death. So, how is Jesus going to fix this problem? What is God going to do? <clears throat> Well, we want to, we'll just look briefly back at how he foreshadowed what he was going to do. And that is in the old sanctuary service in Israel. Um, so, of course, here you have Israel in the wilderness, part of their 40 years, and uh, it's pretty big. There were about 600,000 plus men that came out of Egypt, and then you have women and children and so on. So Moses might have been leading a town of about 2 million plus people out there in the wilderness. That's not a small place, right? It's slightly bigger than Ava. <laughs> slightly. 
And, uh, and so, you know, then you have this sanctuary service. What happens when somebody sins? What are they supposed to do? All right, so they need to bring an offering, some kind of sacrifice that they bring. And depending on their, their, their position or their status or their financial position or whatever, it might be a bird, it might be a lamb, it might be a bull, it might be something of that nature. Uh, we'll just pick a lamb as our example. And uh, let's say that um, you got in a really bad argument with your spouse and, uh, you know, there were some choice <clears throat> words that flew through the air. And, of course, this is Tent City, so your neighbors can hear what happened uh, as well. And, uh, you know, the next day, somebody's waiting to find out when you're going to get that lamb and go walk into the center of town. <laughs> and, and the ones that live close to you know why you're going to the center of town with that lamb. And, uh, and so you take that nice spotless lamb and you go walk through and you come walk to the center of town and you come here to the sanctuary and you go into the outer court. And while you're here in the outer court, you take that lamb and you confess your sin specifically over the head of that lamb. Now, did that lamb participate in your sin? No. Does it have anything to do with your sin? No. No. Does it even know about your sin? No. No. Completely innocent. Completely innocent. But in this symbolic procedure, um, you, your sin is transferred from you to the lamb, right? symbolically, right. not in reality. But, but so that, that sin is transferred to the lamb, and then what do you do to the lamb? Slide. You pick up that knife, and you apply firm pressure down here. And you got to make sure you get through the wool. You got to make sure you get through the skin. You got to make sure you get through the subcutaneous tissues. And you got to make sure you get through the trachea. You, what you're looking for is not the veins, you're looking for the arteries. So you can cut off. Sorry, this is doctor speaking. I'm used to gore and all that kind of stuff. So if you're passing out, sorry, you can plug your ears. Um, so you want to cut off blood supply to the brain so that this animal does not suffer for too long. Because you feel sorry for it, because it didn't have anything to do with what you did. But at your hand, it dies. And while it is bleeding to death, the priest comes along and catches some of that blood, and he takes that blood and he puts it on the four corners of the altar of sacrifice out here. The fat is cut out and burned separately from the lamb on that altar. And the sin in the symbol is removed from the individual and through the lamb is now taken from the individual. Now twice a day the high priest or the priest goes through this same thing, the morning and the evening sacrifice, and a similar process is done, but this time the priest takes that, that blood and he takes it into the sanctuary. And in there you have the altar of incense with four <coughs> horns on the corners and he puts the blood on the four horns of that altar and some of it is sprinkled in here. And in symbol, uh, the sin is transferred from you through the lamb, from the lamb to the priest, from the priest to the sanctuary, and it stays there in the sanctuary. And it accumulates there all year. And then once a year, Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement, right? then the sanctuary is cleansed. And there's a separate sacrifice that is made, and the high priest, with that sacrifice and that blood, goes into not the holy place, but the most holy place, where there's the Ark of the Covenant, the glory of God, and, below, and the mercy seat, praise God, the mercy seat. Mm -hmm. And below that mercy seat is the law of God that was broken by the sin. And blood is sprinkled in there, and the high priest comes back out to the <clears throat> outer court, and there's a goat waiting. Scapegoat. Azazel. And the sin of Israel for the whole year is confessed over the head of that goat. And that goat, in the hands of a fit man, is led out into the wilderness, somewhere out there, and let loose. And it's watched to make sure that it never comes back into the camp again, and it dies out there in the wilderness. And so this is a symbolic way of how God is going to take care of the sin problem. Okay. 
So, who's the lamb? Jesus. Jesus. Who's the priest? Jesus. Jesus. Right? Jesus. Right? He's the priest. He's the lamb. Who's the sanctuary? Jesus. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the number of boards, same as the number of ribs. You've got the number of spinal column. I, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff. There's all, all sorts of correlations that you can, you can come out with the sanctuary. But, uh, and so it was Jesus. <clears throat> so Jesus was the lamb. Did the lamb participate in the sin? No. 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 Did not participate mm -hmm. in the sin. So Jesus did not participate in your sin and my sin. But, the, just like the lamb in symbol became your sin, so Jesus in reality became our sin. Amen. In reality. Not that he participated in it, but he became it on the cross. So, as such, on the cross, as our substitute taking our place, who was it that was sinful? We are. On the cross, taking our place as our substitute, who was it that was sinful? Jesus. Jesus. That's right. Not again that he participated in it. He gave into it. No. But he became it. On the cross, who was it that had taken everything personally? On the cross. Jesus. Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's right. On the cross, who was it that was selfish? Jesus. Jesus. I know this is really hard to, to say, but again, we need to understand what he did at the cross. At, on the cross, who was it that was the perpetrator? Jesus. Jesus. And on the cross, who was it that was the victim that carried that stuff for years? Jesus. Jesus. And on the cross, who was it that was responsible for the bad ripples that you can never get back? Jesus. On the cross, who was it that was powerless to do the good and avoid the evil? Jesus. And on the cross, who was left carrying all the baggage? Jesus. Jesus. And that life deserves eternal death. That's what it deserves. And that's exactly what he paid on the cross. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us but he did so for a reason that we might become righteous. the righteousness of God in him so there's another exchange of the cross and that is that through the cross Jesus God offers to us the perfect life of Jesus mm -hmm. in its entirety in our behalf. Mm -hmm. So when we <clears throat> enter into the experience of the cross, then who is it that's perfect? Mm -hmm. yeah, it's me. And when we enter into the experience of the cross, who is it that has never taken anything personally? Mm -hmm. It's us. That's right. Uh, when we enter into that experience of the cross, who is it that has had a selfless, unselfish, self-sacrificing love? It's us. And, and who is it that has responded perfectly to everything that has ever happened? It's us. And who is it that has good ripples throughout all time and space? Us. And who is it that has power to do the good and avoid the evil? Us. And who is it that's left with no baggage? Us. 
And that life deserves eternal life. That's right. Eternal life. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It is an exchange of life for life, of past for past, of history for history, of experience for experience. At the cross, Jesus comes and he takes everything that our life ever was. And he gives us everything his life was. Now, if you've lived long enough, you know that your past tends to um, <clears throat> affect the direction of your future. <laughs> it's almost like your past is the gun barrel that directs the motion of the bullet. <laughs> because that, of course, is the purpose of the gun barrel, is to direct the motion of the bullet so that you know exactly where the bullet is going. If you take the bullet and you throw it in a bonfire, well, do you know where it's going to go? No, you don't have a clue? Right. So if, you, if you're just standing around having a nice bonfire together and somebody throws a bullet in the bonfire, well, who feels safe? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> right? But if you have everybody standing around the bonfire and everybody's around here and there's a gun and it's pointed off over that way, well, anybody thinking that, that when, if that gun goes off, that the bullet's going to come out and go, oh, oh, oh no. Oh, no. Right? Because it goes in that direction. So God was not interested in just taking us and erasing the gun barrel and giving us a blank sheet. What he wanted to do is he wanted to make in himself the right gun barrel, pointed at the bullseye. So that no matter what bullet you put in that gun barrel, it'll hit the target. And so Jesus lived that life. In himself, developed that gun barrel to hit the target right on. And no matter what life, what bullet you put in there, it'll hit the target. Now, to whom does God offer this gift of the cross? Oh. Yeah, everyone. Right. So it's by God's grace that he offers this gift to everyone. Does everyone end up having the benefits of it? No. Why? Okay, so the gift is offered, but the gift must be accepted. That's right. And the accepting of the gift, the offering of the gift is by grace. The accepting of the gift is by faith. That's right. So it's faith that accepts the gift. And so God offers the gift to all. And those who will accept the gift then have the benefits or the blessings associated with it. All right. So let's dig in a little bit further. Let's say, let's take the perpetrator side. Let's say that you were having a really bad day one day, and uh, you were in an argument with somebody, and at the end of the argument, well, you're alive and they're not. And it was just the two of you, and you know you did it. And you're not excited about this idea of prison and what might happen there and other things like that. You, you very much like your freedom. And, and so, you know, maybe you've watched a few of those shows that talk about how things get disposed of and hidden away and other things of that nature. So you have a few ideas of what to do, and the coroner in the area isn't apparently that right. And, well, you, <laughs> you hide things and, and, and whatever, and you get away with it. Nobody finds out that you did it. And, you know, maybe a year later or so, you move out of that community because you don't want all of those reminders, but you didn't want to move too soon because then that would look suspicious and, and, and so on. And then you go on and you live your life and you can get a job here and you can go there and you can live at this place and so on. You have all this freedom. But everywhere you go, there you are. I was 21 before I figured that one out. <laughs> everywhere, you are, where, everywhere you go, there you are. Um, I'm a slow learner. And, uh, 
I went to the mission field thinking that when I went to the mission field, I'd be a missionary, you know, and praise God, hallelujah, and all that kind of stuff. And it wasn't but two weeks of being in the mission field, and I found out the same miserable person that left home arrived in the mission field. So, so disappointing. So disappointing. But such it is. Everywhere you go, there you are. And so you remember what you did. And, and so, you know, there's that guilt that follows you, and you wonder who's going to find out, and if they do, when, when will they, and what's going to happen, and how is that all going to work out? And if you have the double layer of actually believing that there's a God, and he knows what you did, then he, you know that he knows where you are, and he can just send the lightning bolt anytime he wants to. And, you know, you might be going through an intersection and he's just not going to let that red light go red and it's going to stay green and that dump truck just comes. <laughs> and there you're gone, you know, whatever it is. So so you're always afraid. You're always looking over your shoulder. You're always wondering, you, you know, you always have this guilt and all this kind of stuff and you carry it and you lie and you, you, you do this for years. And then today you find out about the cross and you realize that what God is offering to you by his grace is he's offering for Jesus to step into your place, into your timeline, into everything that you have ever been, and to take that from you and to pay the penalty that it deserves, which it does. And in exchange, he's going to take you and he's going to move you out of your timeline into his. And you get everything that the life of Christ wants. And everything that the life of Christ deserves. And faith takes hold of that gift. You accept it as your own. Now, who is not the perpetrator? <clears throat> you are not the perpetrator. You are not the murderer because Jesus has taken your place. Now, mind you, the cross takes care of guilt. It takes care of divine judgment. It takes care of those things. But rarely does the cross ever resolve cause and effect. Temporally. So... You get convicted that you should confess about what happened and so on, and, and so you do, and there's no statute of limitation on murder, and so a trial, be, you know, is now ensuing, and guess where you end up? In prison. That's right, for murder. And yes, you agree that you did it, because you remember doing it, and you know, the details of it and all that kind of stuff, but, 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 now you're in prison, are you the murderer, or are you not? Hmm. Well, if you have several courts that adjudicate a particular case, which one comes up with the verdict that sticks? the highest court that it goes to. That's right. So you might have the county court, you might have a circuit court, you might have, you know, whatever, and you get the Supreme Court. If the Supreme Court says, not guilty, then guess what? You go free. And there's nobody to go and appeal that one and turn it around unless it comes back to the Supreme Court. Well, who's the higher court? The Supreme Court or God? God. So what is God's verdict on your situation? Murderer or not murderer? Not murderer. That's right. So the heavenly decision, the high court says, you're not a murderer. So now you're in prison, but you're innocent. That's what the cross does. You can be in prison. Yeah, there still might be cause and effect. But you can be innocent because you believe the higher court's verdict that you are not guilty. And now your captivity has changed. Before, you were captive in the mind with the guilt and all of that kind of stuff, but you were free in the body. You could go here and do this and that and the other thing. Now you're captive in the body, but you're free in the mind. Your captivity has changed. 
Wow. What if you're a victim? Is it a problem to be a victim? Okay. <laughs> victimhood is not what happened to you. That's not victimhood. Victimhood is how you respond to what happened to you. <clears throat> there are individuals that I know of and I counsel with and some that are quite close that have had situations where they were taken advantage of by those who should have protected them in years gone by and maybe that situation of being taken advantage of happened over a period of years, multiple episodes over multiple years. But it may not have been happening now for the last 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 50 years. But guess what? They're still a victim. Still a victim. Now, who can hold on to being the victim? Only the victim. Only the victim. No one else can hold on to it except them. But before we then start laying blame, <laughs> we need to recognize that there's only one place that they can let it go. And there's only one way that they can let it go. So many are holding on to being a victim because they don't know how to let it go. Right? They just don't know how. And there's no, there's no condemnation for that, but there, is, there are effects, <laughs> right? There are effects in the life. And, and so there's only one place that they can let it go, and there's only one way that they can let it go. Now, <clears throat> I have talked with uh, many uh, individuals who have, um, who have been abused sexually in the past. And I have asked those individuals, if you had infinite power and no accountability, what would you do to them? And the vast majority have told me, I'd wipe them out. And then the vast majority of those who said, I'd wipe them out, will say, no. I'd torture them first. And then wipe them out. <clears throat> so, you have one individual who has lust, and by that lust, they perpetrate that on someone else. You have another individual that has hatred that if given the opportunity and the circumstances would torture someone else and put them to death. Who needs to be saved? Both of them. Both of them. That's right. So it's, it's usually easy for us to see that the perpetrator needs a savior. But it's not so easy for us to see that the victim needs a savior too. Just as much. Just as much the victim needs a savior too. <clears throat> so let's say, I don't know what your situation is. Maybe, maybe you didn't know who one or a couple of your parents were. Maybe you were uh, left in a, a foster care system that was, to put it mildly, flawed. Um, maybe you were in a situation where you were neglected or abandoned or abused or rejected or other things of that nature. And you've been a victim of many different things and it's, you found it very difficult to love others, especially the ones who did it. And you've held on to that for years. Why? Because, well, you didn't know how to let it go. 
You tried. You wanted to. You knew you were supposed to forgive, so you tried to forgive. But then the hurt's still there. And it just won't go away. And maybe time and distance make things feel better so that they're over there and I'm over here. And so we don't have to really interact with each other. And that's perfectly fine with me. And you can live your life over there and I'll live my life over here. And let's just have as few reminders of the past as possible. And okay. Is that freedom? It's not the freedom that God... What's that? You're back in prison. That's right. You're still in prison. It's not the freedom that God designs. It's not the freedom that Jesus died for. Right. The freedom that he died for is one that will free you to take love from God and be loved. And then to love others, including the ones who try to hurt you. It's a freedom that brings you into the life and the experience of Christ. So that though they stick a bag over your head and punch you in the face and say, ha, 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 tell us who hit you. <laughs> you don't rankle inside wishing you had the power to break free. And if you did, they better watch out. <clears throat> you know, when they were doing that to Jesus, he had the power by a thought, just by a thought, to wipe them out of existence. Gone. How easy, easy it would have been while they were nailing him to the cross, or while they were punching him in the face, or while they were ripping pieces of his beard out, or while they were spitting in his face, or while they were laughing at him, or stripping him naked in front of you know, everybody, or, or any of those things. How easy would it have been for him just by a single thought to say, uh-uh, that's it. But no. He endured. Why? Because he had a higher vision in self sex than uh, save yourself. Yeah. Self preservation. Yeah. He had a higher love. vision. Love. That's right. He had a love that could bear with hell <clears throat> in order to set us free from it. And what God wants to do through the cross and through the working of this plan of salvation is to restore that kind of love in us. <clears throat> so that we can love the ones who torture. We can love the ones who hate. We can love the ones who despise and reject and so on. We can feel sorry for them. <laughs> we, can, uh, we can pity them. We can pray for them. We can intercede for them. But if given infinite power and no accountability, we would not take it upon ourselves to judge them and to wipe them out. So if you have been the victim, and for years so, and now you see that Jesus is offering you by grace an exchange. So that Jesus comes in and he takes your place. All of it. Everything that you ever went through. Every time that you were abused. Every time that you were rejected. Every time that you were despised. Every time that you were unappreciated. Every time that this happened or that happened or the other thing happened. Jesus steps into your life and he becomes it. He experiences it all. He knows exactly what it's like because he's been there. And he knows what it's like to hold on to the resentment and what it's like to hold on to the bitterness. Not because he did it, but because he became your life. And he pays the price it deserves. And in exchange, he moves you off into his past and his history and his timeline where he never took it personally in the first place, and he never held on to it for even a millisecond. 
And he, as the great victim, said, Father, forgive them. They're crazy. Isn't that what he said? Father, forgive them. They're crazy. They don't know what they're doing. If they truly knew what they were doing, they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. It's the craziness of sin and sinful nature. So the cross sets you free from being the perpetrator. The, so the cross sets you free from being the victim. It's no longer you, because when faith takes hold of that gift, now it's Jesus. And he took your place, and he paid the price, and now you get everything that the life of Christ was, and all of his record. And what did the Father say of the Son? This is my beloved Son! Yes, so I'm in love with him. I am well pleased. The Father, Jesus was the beloved, and the Father loved him, and he was well pleased with him. So guess what? When we get the life of Christ, what does the Father think of us and say to us? You're my child. My beloved child. I'm well pleased with you. You're my beloved child. I am well pleased with you. Why? Because you've always lived a, a perfect life in your past? No. Because by faith, you have accepted the grace of the life of Christ, and you have his life. All of it. The perfection of his life. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. All right. Between Jesus and me. You're the me, I'm the me. But between Jesus and me, before the cross, forget everybody else in the world, it's just the two of us. It'd be Jesus and me. How many perpetrators are there? One. Who is it? It's me. After the cross, between Jesus and me, how many perpetrators? One. Who is it? Jesus. Jesus. All right. All right, so pay attention. This is an important one. It's an important one. If you are still the perpetrator, if you're still the one who said and did those things, and said them and did them in that way, if you're still the one that holds on to the guilt and the self-hatred and the you know and, and so on and so forth because of those things in the past, if you're still the perpetrator, then you're living in an experience that is before the cross. Because when you come to the cross, Jesus becomes the perpetrator for you. And you go free. You cannot enter into the experience of the cross and continue to be the perpetrator. Because by its very nature, the cross sets you free from being the perpetrator. Now, <clears throat> Between Jesus and me, before the cross, how many victims? One. Who is it? It's me. After the cross, between me and Jesus, how many victims? One. Who is it? Jesus. If you're still the victim, if you're still the one that they said and did those things to, there's still that, you know, kind of distance thing, or... Uh, there's still the resentment or bitterness or other things of that nature because of what they've said and done and so on and so forth. If you're still the victim, then you're living in an experience that is before the cross. Because when you come to the cross, Jesus takes your place. And you go free. You cannot enter into the experience of the cross and continue to be the victim. Because by its very nature... The cross sets you free from being the victim. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. Oh, yeah, it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. <clears throat> and it's offered to you freely by grace. And it's accepted simply by faith. Now somebody might say, well, that's too simple. 
It's, it, it's too simple. It cannot be that simple. How come I've gone through so much hell and I've never come to freedom? It can't be that simple. I've had those arguments, and in fact, I've argued with God that way with myself going through this process. It can't be that simple. I'm smarter than that. I should have figured this out if that was that simple. <laughs> right? And these are arguments that I have with God. It can't be that easy. Yeah. Who did Jesus say heaven was for? Sinners. Yeah. You're right. Saved by a Savior. Heaven was for little people. Children. Heaven is for the little ones. He said, unless you become like one of the little ones, you won't ever get there. How complex does it have to be for a little one? Simple. 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 In the wilderness, the Israelites were being bitten by snakes. Why? Well, because they were complaining and bickering and, you know, they were complaining that God was feeding them only this worthless bread. They called it worthless bread. Worthless bread. Come on. Manna. Food from him. They're in the desert. God's supplying them for 40 years with that. And they're, all we have to eat is this worthless bread. Oh, you know? And God's like, well, I've been protecting you from a lot of stuff. And I'm just going to not protect you from it right now. And so all the stuff that was always there that he was protecting them from now started biting them. And they start dying. And they're like, oh, we're so sorry. We were such, yes, anyways, help us, you know? And God tells Moses, Moses. Make, a, make a serpent, put it on a pole, stick it up in the center of town. And God said, there's one condition for you to live. Look, upon it. Look at it. <clears throat> Look at it. Right? I mean, come on. Is, it, is the serpent going to fix you? I mean, have you ever, like, you go to the emergency department and the ER doctor says, all right, here's a serpent on the pole. Look at it. Oh, you're good. All right. Go on. <laughs> That'll be five thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah. Right? Right? No. There was nothing in that that could heal you from poison. It was only God that could do it, but God said this is the condition. The condition is you look. And just by looking, you live. And everyone who looked lived, and those who said, I don't see how that could be possible for me to look, and that I just don't see how that would be. They're dead, right? So here with the cross, the condition is simply by faith accept the gift. That's it. That God said, all right, it's simple. Let's make it simple. All it is is by faith accept the gift. And in doing so, you have everything in the life of Christ. You have eternal life. You have the perfection of the life of Christ. And now you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> who now begins to start a work in you. Now, when you give Christ your heart, how much of it do you get? All of it. Never. <laughs> no. No. You don't. I don't. But we think we do. We give him all that we're aware of. But there's a whole lot of our heart we don't even have a clue about. Right? So we give him the little bit that we know about, but there's still a whole lot that is not surrendered to him, that has all sorts of garbage. We still have all of our bad, you know, bad stuff and whatever. And so what does God do? God allows us to have our bottle Right? God allows the bottle to get knocked over. Why? So that what's inside can come spilling out. Why? So that he can send his lightning bolts and condemn you. Oh, I got you this time. This is so fun. Let's get the next one. Right? No, that's not what God is like. He allows it to get spilled over so that what's inside can come out so we can see it. So we can go... Ah. That's that's there too. Yeah. 
Yeah. And when you see that come out, what do you do? You go back to the cross, that's right. You just go right back to the cross. Then you go, oh God, this spilled out. That means it was in there. Oh, I don't want it anymore. Can I have the perfection of the life of Christ, please? Yes, you come to the cross and you accept that divine exchange. You have the perfection of the life of Christ. But now, with that perfection of the life of Christ, you get uh, his life. power. That's right. You get his life. You get power to do the good and avoid the evil. And now begins a process. And this is important. A process. The after the cross experience and the before the cross experience, you can never be in both of them at the same time. Never. It, you're either one or you're the other. But both of them are part of the same process. Just like you can never be standing up and oh, falling down at the same time. Right? You're only, you are either one or the other. You can't be both at the same time. But standing up and falling down are both part of the process of learning to walk. You ever seen a baby that learned to walk without falling? Huh? I haven't. No? I mean, I've seen a nine-month-old with a backpack walking around. And I was like... Wow, how's something that small walking around? Nine, I asked the parents, how oh, old is he? I said, that was nine months. He's walking around just, you know? I was like, wow, that's incredible. Most kids are not even, you know, that's like when they're starting to crawl and this kid's walking. But did he fall in the process of learning to walk? Yeah, sure, he did. Uh -huh. Every child falls in the process of learning to walk. What happens to the child when it takes its first step. It yeah, it wobbles. It takes its first step, and then what happens? Oh. Falls. What does the parent do? Yeah. Oh, you stupid. Why did you fall? I can't believe it. Oh, I just, oh man, I just, oh, these children these days. I can't, why do they figure this stuff out, right? Is that what the parent does? No, not at all. Right? The, yeah, the parent's like, oh, look at this. And one of them's like cheering, and the other one's going. Yeah, get the video of the first steps, you know? You know? And they're like, oh, you know. Does anybody care that the child fell? No. Falling is not a problem. Right? We need to get that in our minds. Falling is not a problem. Everybody in learning to walk falls. Everybody in learning to walk falls. It's okay. God is not there like, oh no! Oh, they fell. Alright, oh, they're back up. Oh, that's good. Oh, they fell! Oh, right. oh they're back up. Okay, we're good. Oh, they fell. You know? God's not like that. You're not in his favor, out of his favor. 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 Because you've fallen and now you're back up. And fallen and back up. No, you are in God's favor. Because he loves you and his love does not change. He's the heavenly parent. He's, you're not any better than God is. And you're encouraging your children to walk. Does God not encourage his children to walk? No, but we think he's going there and he's going to slap us every time we fall down and we're out of God's favor and we're in the darkness of the, you know, and all that kind of stuff every time we fall. No. No. So, you grew up and I grew up over here. That's our default. So what happens when we come to the cross and by faith accept this divine exchange and now we're over here? What happens? Yeah, default takes over. Boom, and we're right back over here. Right? And we're taking things personally, 
and you know, we find ourselves selfish, and, and we're being the perpetrator and the victim and all that kind of stuff, and we're holding on to the bitterness and resentment and other things like that. What do you do? Go back to the cross. Accept by faith that gift of the life of Christ. That's right. And now, oh, look. And, uh, oh, oh, back here. Right? What do you do? Get back up, right? If you fall, get back up. That's okay. Over time, just like a child who's learning to walk, over time, guess what? You spend more time over here, and you spend less time over here. And more time over here, and there's less things that trip you up. And eventually you get to the point where, guess what? You stay here. And you don't go back there anymore. And it's all part of the process of learning to walk. Right? And it's all by his grace. Are you in God's favor, out of God's favor? In God's favor, out of God's favor. In God's favor, out of God's favor. No, you're in his favor the entire time. He loves you. It's okay if you fall. Get back up. Get back up by his grace. Get back up. Oh, what an awesome God we have. Amen. So how much of your sin did Jesus pay for? All of it. All of it. Does that mean everything you ever did? Yeah. yeah. What about everything you would ever do? Yeah. yeah. So does that mean that God knows the future? Yeah. Of course. <laughs> your eyes saw my substance, being yet unformed. And in your book, they all were written in the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. Sure, he knows the future. God doesn't just exist in all space. He exists in all time. <clears throat> all right? So, yes, he knows it all. So when he died on the cross, it wasn't just that Jesus took this lump sum payment and said, here, poof. no, he paid for each sin, each time that would be committed by each person who ever did so. From the beginning of sin to the end of sin, Jesus paid the price for each and every one. And he did so knowing what he was paying for. So when he accepts you as his child, he does so knowing everything you will ever do. Right? Doesn't he know everything you will ever do? Mm-hmm. Yes, he does. So when he accepts you as his child, that means that nothing will ever come up that will make God say, oh, whoops, forgot to pay for that one on the cross. Oh, whoops, that one was too big for me. Can't handle that. Right? No, nothing will ever be too big for God to forgive. Because <laughs> forgiveness is infinite. Sin is finite. An infinite forgiveness can definitely cover any of finite sin. <clears throat> so Jesus already paid the price. You don't have to worry about whether he can cover this or he can take care of this or not. No, he can. <laughs> he always can. <clears throat> but just because he knows that and, and so on, does that mean that I'm automatically forgiven? Well, no. Grace provides for the forgiveness, but faith must accept it, right? And there are conditions to forgiveness. I mean, one of those is confession. Like, are you going to walk away from something that you don't see as a problem? Well, no. If you don't see it's a problem, you're going to keep, you know, continue playing around with it and, and so on. And the point of forgiveness is not just to give someone a verdict that they are okay, although that's part of it. But the point of forgiveness is to save you from the thing itself. Jesus, what is the name of Jesus? It says that he is Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sin. Right? That, that's, that's what Jesus does. He doesn't, he doesn't save you from the record of it and then leave you wallowing around in the mess of it. No, he has power to save you from the sin to itself. And yes, it involves confession. Sure, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And there's repentance as well. In, in Proverbs 28, 13, it says, He who covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and fit forsakes them will have mercy. Right? So there's a turning away from that as well. Not as a condition of, uh, what should I say? It is not a prerequisite to come to God for you to repent. Because repentance is a gift 
from God. And so if you wait to come to God before you've repented, you're going to be waiting a long time. Because it's a gift of God. You come to him first just as you are, but he gives you the gift of repentance, Amen. which is involved in the process of uh, forgiveness, which then turns me not just away from, it, it doesn't just save me from the record of sin, but it saves me then from the power of sin in my life as well. And so I turn away from it. And yes, there might be things where we need to restore things where we have stolen or we have broken things or we have been involved in this or that, and it's appropriate for us to then go to somebody else and say, well, you know what, I was responsible for this and I want to, you know, recompensate you for these things. Biblically, that was cost plus 20%. <laughs> From a biblical standpoint of, uh, you know, restoring those things. And that's, that's part of the whole process too, right? And so it's faith in Christ that his sacrifice is for me and is sufficient for my sin, whereby I am then justified. I'm set right with God. And what are the results of forgiveness? Well, I have no more guilt, <laughs> even though I still remember what happened. Now, what would it be like if God actually took away your memory of everything that happened before? You would have no testimony of what God did and what he saved you from. You know, people will be like, well, oh, what did he save you from? I don't know, but life is pretty good. I don't know. I'm okay. But what was that? I don't know. Right? I have no more bitterness. Why? They didn't do it to me. They didn't do it to me. Who'd they do it to? Jesus. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I am no longer the victim. I am no longer the perpetrator. It's no longer mine. It's not personal. And I can love them because God loves them and I want them to go free just like he has set me free. And I will cooperate with the Holy Spirit in assisting in their freedom however he directs me to. Ah, oh, praise God. His forgiveness frees us, transforms. And one of the functions of forgiveness is to, is to allow us to enter back into relationship. If I went and went and messed around with somebody else, and my wife found out about it, well, she would have an option at that point. Well, she could go to the cross, uh, <laughs> and she could accept that divine exchange on her behalf, and uh, recognize that what I did, I was sinning against Jesus, not against her, and not take it personally, and she could, by God's grace, offer me forgiveness. But in offering me that forgiveness, do I have to come back into relationship with her, or can I choose to go on with the affair? Well, I have a choice. Just because she forgives me, or she offers me forgiveness, does not mean that I have to walk through that door, but it means that I can. But if she would not forgive me, I would not be able to walk through that door. It's closed. So God's forgiveness opens the door so that anybody who wants to can walk back in. But they don't have to. They can choose to stay out if they want to. But it opens the door so that they can. So the cross reconciles relationship. So who can hurt me? Of all we've learned, who can hurt me? Well, Emotionally and spiritually, no one can hurt me. Only I can hurt myself. Because only I can breathe for myself. Only I can eat for myself. Only I can drink for myself. Only I can think for myself. And it's only what I breathe, what I eat, what I drink, not what you breathe, eat, and drink that can harm me or help me. And it's only what I think, not what you think, that can harm me or help me. Now, somebody else might provide an environment of words and other things of that nature that might not be so nice, but God's buffet of love is still available at the same time that they are offering their buffet that's not so nice. And I have the option to either eat from their hurtful environment or to eat from God's loving environment. And my outcome in any given situation is not what somebody else is doing around me. It's 
what atmosphere I choose to take from. Am I taking from God or am I taking from them? <clears throat> A couple of brief stories and then we'll be done. Martha, well, she was married to Herb. They were married for 35 years, had a fairly good relationship. Uh, he was a traveling salesman, so he was gone during the week, home on the weekends. Uh, you know, he supplied for the needs. She was in the home, you know, she was a homemaker and so on, didn't have to have career skills and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, they never did have children together, but you know, life was, life was fine. It was okay. And, and, and she was okay until, well, until she found out. Well, what'd she find out? Well, she found out that Herb was not exactly being faithful to her. In fact, she found out that Herb was not being faithful to her the entire 35 years of their marriage. She found out that Herb had another wife with children in another city, and he would go be with her during the week, I mean, you know, with the other family during the week, and with her, with Martha, on the weekend. Well, you can imagine, now life is not going so well. Uh, family has died. She doesn't have anyone to rely on except for him. She doesn't have any career skills. What's going to happen, you know, with all this betrayal? Every, her, her whole world is turned upside down. And now she can't sleep. She's got all these thoughts running through her head. She gets anxious. Um, now she's on some medication to help out with that. And now she starts developing an autoimmune condition. And that autoimmune condition starts eating away at various different organs in her body. And three years later, she is, as we say sometimes in the healthcare industry, swirling the drain. <laughs> She's about to go. <clears throat> a mess, absolutely a mess. What's the cause of Martha's decline? Well, it's not Herb's infidelity. Because he was unfaithful the whole 35 years and she was okay. When did she begin to decline? After she found out. After she found out, then she could think about it. And she didn't think about it the right way. It was her thinking that led her decline. She believed that her was hers, that the marriage was hers, that it was all hers. She, she believed that he was the source of what she needed, and now she found out he wasn't a good source. And, 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 you know, and, and this was something personal. He did that to her. Well, you might say, well, of course, of course he did. Right? Of course she would think that. Well, yes, yeah, she would think that because she's God. Don't we think that? Yes. Yeah, we think that. Because we're God. Because if you're God, then you're your own. And what's done is done to you. But if you're not God, then it's not about you. And the problem in this scenario, is the problem Martha or is the problem her? It's obvious that the problem is both of them. Because if the problem was only Herb, Martha would be okay. She'd be okay. Because if Herb was messed up and he was, you know, uh, just this, you know, this bad guy and all that kind of stuff, and she didn't have a problem, then she wouldn't be having the problem right now. But her problem is her problem, not Herb's problem. Herb's problem is his own. My children hate this. They really do. Because, you know, they come and they start blaming somebody else and saying, well, I've got a problem with so-and-so. And I say, well, hang on, hang on, you, you have a problem with who? Oh, what? And they say, well, I have a problem with, and I say, hey, hang on, hang on. You just said, I have a problem. I don't care about the with and what came after that. You just said, I have a problem. That's true. You have a problem. <clears throat> now, your problem might be with this person, but later it's going to be with this one, and it's going to be with that thing. But who's, who's got the problem? You do. So what needs to be fixed, them or you? <laughs> well, you. <laughs> because you have the problem. <clears throat> and when you don't have the problem anymore, you won't have a problem with them. Well, her, her problem was with it was her problem. Now, it's possible that she could be grateful that God, you know, he was supporting her and, and you know, through all these years, she didn't have to work and, and, and so on. She can be grateful for God's support through all of this time. 
uh, and, and so on. And if gratitude was, uh, you know, the good weekends that they had together, if gratitude was the response of her thinking after the revelation of this, well, what kind of health would she have right now? So much different. Yeah, so much different. Because it's not what happened to her, but it's what she thought about what happened to her that led her to decline. <clears throat> Margaret. Oh, she had problems. <clears throat> About two years of chronic coughing, hacking up her lungs. Nobody could figure out what's going on. And at the same time, about urinary, con urinary incontinence. Now, you know coughing and urinary incontinence? They don't go well together, right? Um, so, you know, and this was pre-COVID days, and it would be even worse during COVID because nobody liked anybody to cough when, you know, when COVID came around. But, you know, but even then, nobody likes you to cough in their face. Nobody likes you to leak on their furniture. And so her social life was just like, <laughs> you know. And, uh, <laughs> and this was really, really problematic. And uh, she had seen specialists, and she had been, you know, all sorts of tests and interventions and other things like that, and nobody could figure out what was going on. And so she went to see a friend of mine, who's an ear, nose, throat specialist, and, uh, and so, you know, he knows all about this with cause and effect and everything, and so he's wondering what's going on, why, why has this happened, why was it two years ago, and so on. So he asks her, you know, a number of questions and comes to find out that, well, about two and a half years ago, two years, and, well, a few months before she started having the symptoms, she was in a significant conflict with her daughter about the boyfriend, the daughter's boyfriend. Uh, she hated his guts and she didn't want the daughter to have anything to do with the boyfriend. And so she always wanted him to, you know, get away and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And the self-respecting 17-year-old daughter said, well, forget you. And she moved in with the, do with the boyfriend. <laughs> and now mom tries to get in contact with her via phone. And when the conversation comes around to something that the daughter doesn't like, that's it. End of conversation. Right? And she's just... You know, she hates his guts. She wished the daughter would get away from, you know, all this situation and so on. And and now a few months later, now she's got the coughing, she's got the urinary incontinence, and and so my friend's like, well, um, God God created you for love, and love is free, and love provides freedom. And what you're trying to do is control your daughter and make her behave a certain way. You don't think she knows what's right, what's right, and what's not? Right? No. You give her the freedom. When's the last time you ate, well, you went to eat a Twinkie, which you knew wasn't right, and God took it and he knocked it out of your hand. Oh, oh, man. And he grabbed you by the ear. And he dragged you back home and he put in you grounded you. No. And when you got a cigarette, did God take it and go? And it blew up in your face and you're like, oh, man, I'm never doing that again. No. God gave you freedom. He gives you freedom even to do the evil. He gives you freedom. So... Give her freedom. Let her be free. Let her do what she wants to do. But you come to God and you take all the love that you need so that you can love her and you can let her be free. And by the way, love doesn't hate the boyfriend. So come to God and take all the love that you need so that you can love the boyfriend with as well. And so that both can be free. And <clears throat> if they need any help, you can be there to help. And you're not just trying to pester them and, you know, and so on for yourself. Say, no, you come to God, take all you need, and then you pass it along. Well, that was kind of news to her, and so she was desperate. So she went every day. He advised her to go out in nature, spend time with God, and take that love that you need so that you can love them with it. And she did. And she had a repeat appointment about three weeks later, and he was running about an hour late in his practice, and he was surprised that she was there in the, in the waiting room. You know why? He didn't hear the coffee. Right? She was constantly coughing before. He didn't hear the coughing. And he went and, you know, she was excited. She wasn't coughing anymore. And guess what? She wasn't leaking either. It was gone. Right? The cough and the urinary incontinence were gone. Now, was the problem all in her head? Well, she had very real stuff going on in the body. But the foundation of the issue was in her mind. It was an issue where she could, she was not taking so that she could have the love of God and she was not giving it away. 
Because God created her to be a channel, taking love from him and giving love away to others. And it, whenever that channel gets blocked, then there's problems. You want to fix the problems? Open the channel. Take from God and give freely to others. Now, I don't have time for migraine headaches, <clears throat> diabetic ulcers and amputations and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but we'll get to Michelle. Michelle, <clears throat> uh, she came... Uh, she's one of my patients a number of years ago, and uh, ovarian cancer. So she had ovarian cancer, stage 3C, I think. She had about 11 tumors in the abdomen. Um, every time they did chemotherapy, she got done with chemo, and the tumors were bigger and more in number, and two rounds of chemo, and then they said, well, let's do experimental stuff, right? We're going to put you in a clinical trial to see how these things might work and she's like ah not doing that she had been an athlete now she could barely walk she used to be able to run all the time and and, and so on and and so she ended up coming to the lifestyle center where i was working at uchi pines and in, in alabama <clears throat> and of course we did the usual stuff put her on a whole food plant-based diet and, and exercise and you know all that healthy stuff and we did some hydrotherapy getting her temperature up and you know hyperthermia treatments because that helps with cancer and and some herbs and other things of that nature but I know that every effect has a cause, right? <clears throat> so we started talking about her life and other things of that nature and come to find out, well, she never knew who her father was. Her mother left her with the grandparents when she was eight and the mother was a party girl and into drugs and alcohol and all that kind of stuff and partying and, and, uh, and she, uh, you know, but mom, mom would come back into the scene with her and the grandparents every once in a while and just create chaos because she was jealous of the relationship now that she had developed to the parents and, and, uh, oh, and there was all this resentment and bitterness against the mother for how she had, you know, raised her and treated her and whatever. And the mom was still crazy, still party girl even though she was old and, uh, you know, and still like that. And I knew that resentment, well, it, her resentment for her mother might not be the cause, but it's not going to help the cure, <laughs> right? Might not be the cause, but it's not going to help. And so it's something that needs to be resolved. So we, I talked with her about coming and taking from God his love so that he could be, so that she could be free from her mother, recognizing that her mother's doing what her mother's doing because that's what's in her mother. She doesn't have to take it personally because it's not about her. And she can come and she can take from God, who's consistent, who's loving, who, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And then you can just love your mother with that and let her be free to be crazy. Well, the end of the session, 17 and a half days, uh, 17 days later, well, her cancer markers were back in the normal range. Oh, she's happy about that. Two months later, six of the 11 tumors are gone. The five remaining ones are smaller than what they were before. Everything's going away. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And another couple months after that, she calls and she's crying. And everything's, you know, cancer markers are back up and everything like that. What's going on? Mom came back in the picture. Chaos. She forgot everything we talked about. She's now back in the bitterness and, you know, the resentment and all that kind of stuff. So talked with her again. <laughs> your mom is your mom. Let her be free. That's, that's what's in her. You don't have to be controlled by that. You can come, from, come to God and take everything that you need and then love her. Let her be free. But love her with the love that God gives to you. She's still free. She's cancer free. She's still doing well. She's a friend on Facebook and, and so on. I just checked on her profile last week. Um, and, and, you know, and so on. So was it all in her head? Well, she had cancer in her body. She had real stuff going on. But the foundation of the issue was in her mind. And when that issue was resolved, then the effect started going away. And there are stories, stories, stories. Right? Sickness of the mind prevails everywhere. Nine-tenths or 90% of diseases from which men suffer have their foundation here. It's mm -hmm. true, it's true. So when you've got your roots planted in the wrong soil, don't be surprised if things are going to go bad. Don't be surprised. But don't be content with just dealing with the symptoms. And don't be content just with dealing with the behaviors because you've got to get down underground and work on the real issues, the sources, the beliefs of the individual. Yes, there is a law that governs love. And that law, if it's broken, 
Well, you can have real physical symptoms. You can end up with real physical de disease, and you, <laughs> you can very much die. That's the price of sin, by the way. And s breaking the law is sin. It's breaking God's law, the foundation of which is love. And so disease really is the result of a love problem. Let me say that again. Disease really is the result of a love problem. I'm not going to go through and read the texts, but Exodus 15.26, you can write them down. Exodus 15.26, disease is a love problem. You read it. It'll tell you. Disease is a love problem. Proverbs 3, 7 and 8, disease is a love problem. And health is the result of love. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 4, 20 through 23, They'll tell you that disease is a love problem, and health is the result of love. Uh, Deuteronomy 7, 12 through 15, it will show you disease is the result of a love problem. Second Chronicles 7, 14, <clears throat> same thing. You'll find out it's the result of a love problem. Matthew 13, 15, it's the result of a love problem. And where do you go free? Where do you go free? Where do you find that love? You don't find that love with other people. It's right there at the cross. And that's where we can be free. And if the healthcare industry never goes here, then the healthcare industry will never have the answer. Right. Never have the answer. That's great. Mm -hmm. Dear Heavenly Father, oh, what a beautiful gift you offer to us in the cross. We can be free from being the perpetrator. We can be free from being the victim. We can be free from all the garbage, and we can have the perfection of the life of Christ. And you offer it to us right now as a gift. And Lord, maybe there are some here that have not realized this before. Uh, sure, we've been in church, we've done all sorts of things and, and so on, but we've never really been free. And it's time. It's time to accept that gift freely and to begin to walk. If that's you, and you know that God is offering to you that gift, of freedom, of the life of Christ, his perfection and everything in exchange for yours, so that you can be free, truly free. And you choose to accept that gift now. Then with our eyes closed and heads bowed, nobody looking, just raise your hand to heaven. Yes, Lord, that's me. Amen. And thank you, Lord. Thank you for the gift of that freedom and the perfection of the life of Christ. And now the Father looks at us and says, oh, you are my child whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Thank you, God, for that love, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.